I decided that with everything that's going on with uh, the last several months that we needed to look at the lighter side of history. We don't need to do anything terribly significant tonight. And we definitely need to toast the evening with a glass of wine. The, um, I would like to start, first of all, I wanna give credit to the photographs for this production. Uh, the Santa Barbara Historical Museum uh, loaned a lot of the photographs as did the Montecito Association History Committee and the rest I have found public domain on the internet. So I want you to look at this lovely group of people in 1901. They're uh, gathering something that we have not been able to do for quite a while. They're sitting on the steps of the Santa Barbara Country Club, which once stood on uh, the, uh, what's basically the grounds of the Santa Barbara Biltmore today. And uh, they're having a great time. And we someday soon, hopefully, will be right there with them, being able to gather again. But these people are um, pretty interesting. They're some of the movers and shakers of Santa Barbara in 1901. The man on your right is Joel Remington Fithian. He's smoking a cigar, he's standing up, and he's laughing at the camera. And that's exactly what Joel was. He was a very um, uh, fun man. He really enjoyed his life. His brother Barrett is sitting down below reading the newspaper. And the man in the center sitting on the step looking sideways is a man named John Drew. And he was an actor. So I want you to think Blythe Danner and Drew Barrymore. He was one of the, um, the, the progenitors of that particular family. Uh, the rest of the, the group there are the Parrot family. And that is a group out of San Francisco that used to come down in winter and summer in Santa Barbara. We're gonna get back to some of the fun times they had in Santa Barbara later. But right now, I wanna move, get us on the road with some awful auto, awesome autos, excuse me, and awful roads. Um, lovely car, it's on the Riviera. She's got her two little dogs with her. They sort of blend into the uh, seat color wise. Um, and this is one of the earliest cars in Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara, uh, the first car that ever came through Santa Barbara was in 1899. And it was uh, basically, it came with the circus and it was a circus clown car, which was sort of prophetic because as these early days of cars evolved in Santa Barbara, there were plenty of times that some very strange or funny things happened. Uh, this car, if you notice, it's so early that it doesn't even have a steering wheel yet. And it's up on the Riviera. So take a look at the background of the photograph and you will see a very early Riviera. And I notice, I don't know if your screen is big enough, but I notice a tent up there. That's a white tent. So somebody is living in a tent on the Riviera. Um, this is another um, rendition of an early car. As you can see, they didn't quite know what to do with the passengers, so they put them up front. I can't imagine that it was terribly um, comfortable or safe to have them there. But the people in this picture are um, are known and some of their descendants still live in Santa Barbara today. The woman to the right is Sally Taylor. She married um, she married an Alexander and then a Stowe. And so she is related to that whole family that still exists in Santa Barbara. Probably one of the most important people in this picture is the man on the right with the gray mustache. His name was Charles Taylor. And Charles Taylor worked for the Carnegie Foundation. He headed one of the foundation divisions. And he and Henry Pritchett, another uh, sometime resident of Santa Barbara, were responsible for bringing a lot of the um, monies and grants that came to Santa Barbara during this period of time. But this is them oh, probably in the earlier 1900s. Eventually, the automobile uh, grew a back seat for, and it also grew a steering wheel. So this is a touring car. The woman driving and looking a little tentative is um, the Mrs. Arthur Truesdale Ogilvy. Her son uh, formed the, uh, the uh, branch of law firm uh, along with others. 
And as you can see, she is, has a bevy of her girlfriends in the car and they're going out for a little Sunday drive. Now, the automobile was interesting because unlike the International Harvester in a six horse team, uh, a team of four horses drawing a carriage, women were as entranced with the automobile as were men. And all advertisers for automobiles and things to do with automobiles played on this because if you look at this, this is from 1906. And we still have this beautiful Gibson girl, very elegant, standing in front of a car to sell automobiles. Uh, this particular task or style of advertising has come down to us today, but has devolved into the hotties of the car culture. Uh, as you can see, this girl is uh, posing with a very fancy car. Uh, actually, you need to know this was the tamest of the, um, of the models that I chose from the internet. And she's um, actually uh, quite tame. Uh, if you look at some of the other ones of hotties of the car culture, you would think you were looking at Hustler magazine. Anyways, we've come a long way, ladies. Uh, the automobile and the horse. Obviously, lots of people, by uh, the middle of the, about 1910, there were an equal number of automobile garages and livery stables in town. And there was inevitably going to be a conflict, sometimes with disastrous results between the two. The other thing about the automobile was that we only had dirt roads initially, and although there very quickly became a, a good roads movement, but if you were driving on the Casitas Pass, which had originally been founded as a stagecoach route, and the reason for that was that stages had to go on the sands along the Rincon Cliffs to get to Ventura, and therefore the stage schedule, what changed every single day depending upon the tides, the same thing now was true of automobiles. They would have to drive on the sands. And this was obviously uh, difficult. They had to wait for low tide as well. So they used the old stagecoach route, took nine extra miles to get from Carpinteria to Ventura. But the road was tortuous. It was curvy. It was narrow. It was dirt. And cars were constantly falling off of it. Um, so this car has come down the side of a hill. and. If it were still usable, they would have put the car in reverse and slowly in increments backed it up the hill by putting blocks in front of the front wheels to hold it in place, go a little more distance, quickly move the blocks, and then get to the top of the hill. This car, unfortunately, has uh, looks like it has a broken axle, and so some other uh, kind of, they're going to have to bring in a team to tow it on out of there. Um, Another thing, if you were going to Los Angeles, that you had to negotiate as a driver was the Caneo grade. The Caneo grade had 90, uh, excuse me, <laughs> 49 turns and cutouts on it. It was extremely steep. Farmers with horse and wagons would have to block their front wheels to prevent uh, the cart from getting in front of the horse, so to speak. And they would basically just slide the wagon down those 49, those 49 curves. Um, Thad McMillan, some of you may know him. He was a long time, he is a long time uh, uh, docent, excuse me, uh, board member of the Santa Barbara Historical Museum. Um, he, uh, told me uh, that his father used to live in Ventura and whenever his father would buy a car he would first take a test drive and he would see if it could get up that grade in first gear and if it couldn't then he wouldn't buy it because the engine wouldn't be sound and cars that didn't have a first uh, didn't have a sound engine would have to back up the grade because as Thad told me the uh, reverse is actually the lowest gear then in 1913, as far as Casitas Pass went for a major route of uh, transportation, uh, the problem everybody was solved when they built the rink on Causeway. Think of this as three segments of pier that basically 
uh, paralleled the coastline. And um, it was wooden and it uh, saved those nine miles and all of that tortuous driving over a tall uh, mountain and, and hills, et cetera. Uh, so at this point they thought, okay, this is great. Our problem is solved. Not so fast. Carr still went off into the drink and here you see a team of horses trying to save the horseless carriage from the high tide. Now, I love this picture. It's a picture of the Rincon. Of course, you've got, you know, your usual uh, group of people watch, looking at the action. But if you look in the background on the point by the ocean, you'll see an oil derrick. In fact, you'll see a couple of oil derricks because Rincon uh, was for a long time a, a place where oil was being drilled. So I'm putting this photograph around 19, between 1920 and 1928. If you were going north on, um, and along the Gaviota coast, uh, you had some other problems. And I love this photo because it really demonstrates what it must have been like as for automobiles traveling north along that coastline. This is a photo from 1898 uh, when the, uh, railroad was trying to what they called bridge the gap between the rail, the line that came up in 18, uh, excuse me, 1887 to Santa Barbara and one that got stalled up in San Luis Obispo. But in order to do that, they had to build all of these trestles across all of the ravines and canyons in the, on the, along the Gaviota coast. What you see here over here on, I'm gonna use my cursor. What you see here is the road. This is the road. This road would go down, 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 and off the screen, obviously, and into this canyon. It would cross a bridge. This is a Royal Hondo, by the way. Cross a bridge and then come up on the road, as you see, on the other side of the canyon. And there was a young man who, who in his later years wrote about a trip he took in 1908. And he was trying to get from Ojai to San Luis Obispo. He started out in Ojai and he had to cross the stream 13 times and got stuck in one of the crossings and a team of horses had to pull him out. Along the way, he had so many flat tires that by the time he got to Santa Barbara, he needed to buy new, all four new tires. Well, they didn't have them, so they had to send to Denver for them, and he had to wait in Santa Barbara for eight days. When he finally got the tires, he took them on a test drive to make sure everything was okay, and his water pump gave out. So finally, that gets fixed, and he goes off on his merry way along this coastline. And he says the worst part of the whole trip, in spite of everything that happened before, was this section of the Gaviota Coast, where he went into at least 50 ravines and in and out and had many more flat tires. Travel by automobile was no picnic in those days. And I think there's a reason that pe some people refuse to give up their horses. Now, in those days, there were only two bridges across the San Inez River. One was at the end of Refufio Road, and the other, and that went to San Inez, and the other was in Lompoc, and it crossed the San Inez River there. Anywhere else that you wanted to cross the river, you had to find some way to do it. And this man apparently has found a way by hooking his passenger up and having him pull him across the river in 1911. This is off the San Marcos Road. Um, I'm going to take a little segue and tell you a story about the, the San Inez River while we're here. And that is in 1926, there was great flooding. Remember, we had the earthquake in 1925, and then to, you know, to add to everybody's troubles in 1926 early, and there were tremendous floods, so much rain, unbelievable. Along the San Inez River, there were many, many homesteaders and people who were um, backcountry people. And one man, Carl Snow, 
uh, remembered that he um, that he was back in the back country during that day and, and he remembered that the rain was coming so high he thought he was going to lose his cabin. So he tried to move everything up uh, up the hillside and just he had just managed to get everything up there, his horses, uh, some basic supplies, when the river rose so high and then a twister came and it sucked up all the water in the river, it sucked up all the water that was lying, that was in the, on the land and sucked it all up into the sky and then let it all go. And it didn't rain cats and dogs at that time, it rained worms. There were actually thousands upon thousands of angleworms falling to the ground. He came back to town and reported on this incident. So I'm getting us off the road right now and we're going to go back to town. This is the town in 1902. I love this photograph because you can really see what we once were like. This street, try the cursor again. You see where my cursor is? This street right here is Carrillo. It crosses Mission Creek here. You see the railroad sign. And then as it goes off of this picture, it goes to the polo fields. There was a polo field below in an old bean field below the Mesa. This street is Canon Perdido Street. And this street going across is Rancheria Street. So no, right now, obviously, the freeway has divided our town in half. But at that time, we were all one. And it has a really different feeling to everything. OK. Well, lots of things going on in town as we were growing into the town that we are today. Uh, Mary Ashley and a huge group of other ladies decided that the town needed a hospital. And so they started a campaign and started fundraisers to raise the money to build a hospital that they were going to call Cottage Hospital. And they had a great fair and part of that fair was a, uh, a segment called the Trade Fair, which played out at the Libero Theater. And what a trade fair was, all the businesses in town would look for their wives, their daughters, or the prettiest shop girls, and they would dress them up in whatever they were selling. So for instance, Show's grocery store would have one girl with biscuits all over her dress and another one had, uh, uh, would put Carmen Miranda to shame. She had so much fruit on her. But the one I think that everyone had a hard time keeping a straight face for was the Santa Barbara Gas Company. This young lady has a coal scuttle for a hat and her jewelry and buttons are made of coal itself. Then as now, mother's beamish boys with cheeks of tan were filled with mischief. And when I found this photograph, I knew exactly who was doing it. Look at these, the expressions on their faces. They are delightfully up to no good. And the newspapers at the time were always filled with the antics of these young gentlemen and others like them about what they were doing, the slingshots that were shooting out the windows, the robins that were being shot out of the sky, the, um, what else were they doing? They were, um, uh, periodically, they would release all of the dogs from the dog pound. But there was one incident that kept the newspaper happy with stories for at least a couple of weeks. This is the, um, County Courthouse. It stands, it's the one before the, earth, the earthquake tumbled this one to the ground and it stands on where the sunken garden is now. The sheriff, Arkley, uh, dis, uh, who was in charge of this, uh, decided that he wanted to beautify the grounds by planting flower beds. And he used the guests of the county jail to do the labor. No sooner were all the, plant, the beds planted than that night, carnations were sliced, beheaded by vorpal swords, and the pansies were snicker-snapped into dust. The newspaper 
and Sheriff Arkley were outraged and told those scoundrels they better keep to the background. It was a terrible thing to have done. Well, the scoundrels, of course, wanted to keep the background. Sheriff Arkley replanted the flower beds and again, the same thing happened. Somebody was having a really good time. Anyways, Sheriff Arkley finally decided he needed to post a guard so that this would not happen at night. And uh, the guard stood guard for several nights and nothing happened. And then one night he heard something and a rustling and he saw uh, what he thought somebody climb a tree. He ran up to the tree, tried to climb it as well. And then he heard an unearthly rattle and a horridly deep chuckle. And he jumped down terribly afraid knowing something was not right up there. So he claimed the next day that he had stood his post, he had not fallen asleep, but when dawn came there was nothing in the tree. But he knew, he knew who had been doing all this bad stuff. It was the ghost of Jim Rebus, he said, an old horse thief who had escaped from the jail and had hidden in that very same tree before he was captured and sent off to prison. I think there were some very, very smart little boys chuckling up their sleeves by the end of that uh, session. Either that, it might have been one of the one of the thieves that foray in my yard, a raccoon. We've recently had a whale uh, land in Santa Barbara, uh, a, a wash ashore, a dead whale, and um, this one happens to be. In, it's in San Francisco, uh, probably right around 1901 also. And as you can see, some enterprising proprietor of a cafe has decided it would make a whale of a billboard. And of course, the boys themselves are standing on top of the whale, as of course they would do. Uh, there was a, this happened in Santa Barbara as well, uh, two young boys who were, um, one was the gardener's son at the Miramar and the other one was a guest at the Miramar, one morning saw a whale uh, floating offshore at the Miramar. And so they borrowed a boat, uh, rowed it out there and just, and just to check it out. And uh, somehow they didn't notice that it was dead. They decided that they wanted to bring it ashore um, and so they found, found a way to rig it up with ropes and whatever, and they towed it ashore um, with the rising tide. Unfortunately, then it came in and it was bloated and it was quite ripe. And uh, the entire town of Montecito came down to insist that it be taken away. Uh, it, they had to wait for the next high tide to finally get rid of it. This is Moore's Landing um, that uh, is off sort of between Santa Barbara and Goleta and it was um, off Moore Mesa. And um, the family that was with Joel Fithian and crew on the steps of the Santa Barbara Country Club came out here one day for a picnic and they really knew how to have a good time. They came out with four horses, but to get out on the pier, the girls decided that they would use their compatriots to pull them. And of course, they are dressed in their best bathing suits. In this picture, which comes from a photo album that was given to the Montecito Association History Committee, you can see that the provisions are coming down in a blanket and as are the drinkables. They uh, are playing here on the sands, again, wearing lovely outfits. Again, this is 1901. So these are the bathing costumes of 1901. And later on, or perhaps before, taking a little walk on the beach. Um, this man who drove them out there is Francis Townsend Underhill. Now, Francis Townsend Underhill was a very important character in our town. And, and uh, he, I mean, he was involved in so many things. He deserves a history happy hour all to himself. But basically he owned three ranches. He was an architect. He was a horse breeder. He owned the 
the the race the agricultural park racetrack he was a member of the Santa Barbara Club and several other things. He was a partner with Joel Fithian in a livery business and tourist business. He was, he started the New York Horse Show. Uh, he married into the uh, De La Guerra family and he ended up in the later part of his life breeding dahlias and pigs. And here he is, wine and comestibles have certainly um, Loosened him up. This is Francis Underhill here at the bottom. And I don't think anyone's seen a fun picture of him before, but now we have. Back in town, uh, we have, we're so lucky. We have so many beautiful canyons and some of them of course have un unfortunately un changed tremendously and um, interestingly enough, I just ran across uh, some information that said that it was a, a flood, I believe, in 1918, not the 1914 one, that said that the canyons were unrecognizable. So this has happened before, and that makes me feel good because it means they will recover. Um, but in these canyons, there were many, many homesteaders. And in this particular canyon, this is Rattlesnake Canyon, there were two especially who were very interesting. One was a man named John Stewart. He was a Scotsman. And he built lower down in the canyon than this, a, uh, an adobe house on the steep side of a hill. He planted uh, pepper and apple trees because if you had a homestead, you had to build a house and you had to improve it in some way. So he fulfilled those basic requirements. He was sort of a character. He was known to dress his mule in bib overalls and he greeted hikers in this manner. Ah, look at me, this is all that remains of an English gentleman. Well, I don't know that any Scotsman would ever want to be an English gentleman, but there you go. Uh, for years, a crumbling chimney and an old pepper tree marked the spot, but it is completely gone now. Uh, by age 82, he moved down and became a lay brother at St. Anthony's, and at age 93, he was working as a gardener at the mission. Um, okay. Then the other one, that's the name I'm looking for, was William O'Connell. He was an Irishman, like you can believe it. An Irishman and a Scotsman were living in the same canyon. Uh, O'Connell claimed one quarter acre and part of that included what we know today as the meadow at the top of Rattlesnake Canyon. Uh, his patent for the uh, homestead was uh, awarded in 1900. Now he also had to you know, improve the property. And you can see it's being improved over here with this sort of fence and a cabin and a fruit tree. The cabin was unique in that it was going to be very difficult to bring building material up there and there wasn't a whole lot at hand. So he decided to flatten all of these kerosene can, empty kerosene cans that he got for free and bring them up on his mule to the canyon, make a framework of Ceanothus branches, and build his, built his, uh, his cabin. Now this became a wonderful uh, tourist site, and lots and lots of people came up to hike and look at it, including in 1916, this particular couple wearing the very best of L.L. Bean wear of the day. Uh, the city uh, of Santa Barbara and the Chamber of Commerce had renamed the Rattlesnake Canyon Los Canoas Trail. Nobody liked the name and eventually the city had to um, just gave up and removed it and called it Rattlesnake. But they had to put a caveat on their brochure saying, you know, it's not because there are rattlesnakes there that we that is called Rattlesnake Canyon. It's called Rattlesnake Canyon because of its slim sinuosity. Nice work, boys. So let's go to the women of the day. In uh, the turn of the 20th century, uh, we had women promoting the idea of the new woman, and we had the Gibson girl. 
this particular Puck magazine cartoon, Puck is uh, gently reproving the clergyman who says that, who is critical of the new woman. Um, and he shows the clergyman uh, these things. He says, do you think, my clerical friend, that the old ideals were better than these? And if you have a small screen, you probably can't see it, but you're seeing a woman teacher. You're seeing the, uh, a, a woman chastising a man for being cruel to his horse, women working on the battlefields, women ambulance drivers, um, women artists, women golfers. Anyways, he, um, the new woman was extremely popular and uh, women embraced her obviously and eventually men did too. And the um, only thing is that she was still a slave, if not to her husband, to her corset. The corset of the day was supposed to be an improvement over what was there before, and I'm not quite sure what could be worse than this. This was called the S-curve corset, and it put the woman in this particular S-shaped curve uh, shape. Anyways, uh, this particular ad belonged to, uh, it came from a scrapbook, from belonging to Pearl Chase, none other than our famous Pearl Chase. And if you want to see what it looks like on a real woman instead of this romanticized version, this is it. No, thank you. Doctors of the day tried to educate women as to what this kind of corset was doing to their bodies. In fact, Jane Edmund, Dr. Jane Edna Spalding, the first superintendent of Cottage Hospital, was very, very um, against the corset and wrote copious amounts of letters to the editor, et cetera, uh, talking about how dangerous it was. But uh, the young girls of the day, it was all about the looks. Luckily for the 1920s flappers, the S-curve was out. Their corset flattened everything. And they got rid of the Gibson girl hairdo, that romantic uh, style, and bob their hair because these were jazzy girls. Not everybody liked the bobbed hair, even this little boy. And in this cartoon, he says, take one look at that tail, Mur Muriel Murphy, and then tell me you ain't sorry you got your hair bobbed. It could even lose you your job. And there was a young teacher in Santa Paula who lost her job because she bobbed her hair. Okay, oil. We've been dealing with oil since it, in Santa Barbara area since it was discovered in the eight, late 1800s in Summerland. And this is what Summerland looked like back in those days. Not that sweet little beach community that we see now. We had the very first example of um, offshore oil drilling. And we have been dealing with oil in this town ever since in many, many ways. Um, when they discovered oil here, people came from all over the United States looking for oil elsewhere as well, including the beaches of Santa Barbara, the beaches below Hope Ranch, the beaches below the Mesa, the beaches at the Miramar. When one group built a derrick in one day on, in Sharks Cove on Fernald Point, uh, Hannah Fernald, who owned the property said, no way. She got her two sons, Charles, as you see here on the left, and Reginald, and William Waples Burton, Billy, uh, her agent, and Ro Robert Cameron Rogers, the editor of the news press, and a poet, and they gathered together a team of 10 men and became the very first monkey wrench gang in the, at midnight, the day that the Derrick had been raised, they went and unraised it. They basically dismantled the whole thing, placed all the parts neatly by the railroad tracks and stationed a man with a gun on the cliff should anyone try to do such a thing again. 
Today, and this is not today, this is about 1930 or 40, um, Sharps Cove never would see oil wells or oil drilling. And this picture is definitely since the, you can tell it's from af probably between 1930 and 1940 because of all the groins trying to hold the sand. And this is what the highway looked like. This is sort of the iconic look that we still have today, no matter all the different changes in the highway. Um, you can see there was once a pier at the Miramar over here, and you can see there's not very, there are not very many houses on that point. Santa Barbara also had a, uh, a lot of fun with circuses and different uh, shows that would come to town. Circuses had been coming to, through Santa Barbara since the uh, Spanish and Mexican days. In 1901, Ringling Brothers Circus came, I believe, for the first time to Santa Barbara, and we are lucky enough to have a photograph of the State Street Parade with the elephants. Now, Buffalo Bill Cody came, Ringling Brothers Circus came, Sells Flota Circus came, lots of different companies came and presented their big top shows in Santa Barbara. But in 1922, a little top show arrived in town when a troop of 300 educated fleas were going to perform for the population. Their ringmaster, Professor Rule, was just looking for a proper venue. Now, this was real. <laughs> I didn't realize this. It's amazing to me, there really were flea circuses. People would gather fleas, they would, I don't know, minusculely uh, put little collars on them, little gold collars on them. They would then attach them to wagons or sometimes they'd glue clothing on them and they would find ways to make these um, animals kind of by doing their own thing, they would pull a little big tiny carriage. They would pull a, um, they would swing in a merry-go-round. It was really strange. And when this came to town, this is what the newspaper had to say. Um, he said, the writer had a good time with this. He said, these fleas, you understand, are not the common or garden variety of insect who summer at the beach or for amusement play loop-the-loop -loop on Fido's tail. Not so. They are the very creme de la creme of fleedom far above the average in intelligence and breeding. Each one wears a gold collar around his neck and performs amazing stunts, such as pulling tiny wagons, jumping through hoops, juggling, riding bicycles, dancing, firing cannons, and other things of which the ordinary flea would never dream. He goes on to say that the uh, ringmaster, Professor Rule, lives off the fleas, uh, but the fleas also live off of him which is disgusting. Um, flea circuses didn't need a big venue because they could be performed out of a little tiny suitcase, but the powers that be did not give Professor Rule a, uh, a permit to present his flea circus, so he decided to move on to Santa Cruz, where perhaps they would be a little more open-minded. However, he came with 300 fleas and he left with 299. And this is what the newspaper had to say about that. One valuable member of the company made a successful break for freedom yesterday and was still missing when the company made the jump to Santa Cruz. According to a description furnished by, to the police by Professor Rule, the runaway was a light blonde in complexion, affectionate in disposition, and answered to the name of Busiris. Um, the police have promised to keep on the lookout for him. Well, that sort of brings us to close to the end of this. And so as we prepare for our own escape, please be sure to practice the ultimate in social distancing. I wish you happier, more prosperous days ahead.